This is Matthew McConaughey. Natalie Portman. James Patterson. Michael Ian Black. And you are listening to Five Questions with Dan Chabell. Felicia, welcome to Five Questions. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited for these five <laughs> individual questions you're going to ask me. Very, so very thrilled. We're going to start off really early. What was it like being homeschooled throughout most of your childhood while also performing in concerts and competitions? Yeah, I was kind of a violin prodigy-ish kind of kid. So I uh, was homeschooled from like age six to 16. And I got a full scholarship to go to University of Texas then. And I went to college very early. Being homeschooled was a very interesting experience. I didn't know anything different, but I certainly wasn't exposed to children uh, in a casual setting at all. I had a lot of lessons, but when you drop a kid off for lessons, it's very structured. There's a lot of supervision. So I didn't really experience a lot of uh, inclusivity, but I didn't experience ostracism either, which kind of puts me in this very naive place as an adult. So when I first moved to Hollywood, I was like, why aren't you impressed that I had a 4.0 in math and I'm a violin <laughs> prodigy? And if I go to acting class, the numbers of hours I put in doesn't actually translate to success in the business. How does that work? So it certainly gave me a unique perspective on the on, on the world. It gave me an outsider perspective on especially how women are treated and uh, how people are sort of uh, categorized as weird which I don't love because I, I think everyone's interesting for who they are. Um, and it certainly uh, set me back in a lot of social ways, uh, but at the same time, I wouldn't trade it for anything because it makes me who I am. My weirdness makes me who I am. It's my superpower. Yeah, that's what, it, I mean, you wrote a book on it, right? <laughs> embrace, exactly. your, embrace your weirdness. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I definitely believe that. And I think everyone's weird in their own way, whether they admit it or not. And you've done a ton of different creative pursuits. I think that's what makes you really interesting, even though you know you all have experience with so many different like technologies and platforms. So how have you expanded your creative pursuits from your early career in acting? Yeah, I basically just loved performing and I love more than anything making things with other people. I was uh, you know, I was in an orchestra, I was in the Austin Symphony, I did a lot of theater when I was a kid and you know, getting together with people and making things is really important to me. And so whenever I see an opportunity, you know, it's not like I'm excited to be a pioneer or I am jumping at the chance to, you know, be first, although I do have that impulse, but I just want to tell stories. And especially if you're in Hollywood, a lot of your stories don't get told. Um, even if you love them and you push them through the system, it's just a very, very hard system to navigate. It's based a lot on luck. Uh, not necessarily talent, but also who you know, and being in the right place at the right time. So uh, it is very challenging. And so I guess every step of the way, I've tried to just get the stories I want to uh, tell out and the roles that I want to play out there. Um, I jumped on uh, in 2007, I was one of the first scripted web series to be put out there and got very well known for it. My outfit from that is in the Smithsonian Museum right now. If you could see it in the American History Museum on display, which is wild to me because I literally, you know, shot the whole show in my house mostly. Um, so, you know, that's 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 my impulse. I have stories. I have characters I want to play. I want to make things. And every step of the way, I'll do that, whatever the budget level, because I'd rather make something than get paid to put in development. My latest project is called Third Eye, and it's an Audible original. And it's the, you know, the role that I've always wanted to play, and I couldn't make it through TV. So I, I made it in audio. And, you know, cr creating something in audio is a very different experience than if you have video involved. And that was a great learning curve. So I, t I like to jump into things that I don't quite understand and see where the limits of uh, my creativity are are and then go past them with the help of a lot of other people who know better than me <laughs> you just teed up the next question perfect oh great <laughs> so what was the process of crafting the story and assembling an all-star cast for this new amazon original third eye yeah it was a tv show that i came up with in 2015 and it was going to be my next great role after uh, the guild which is the web series that i created in 2007 and was one of the first people viewing videos online uh, scripted videos. So yeah, I, unfortunately it didn't sell and it was super devastating to me. And at the time I was running a company called Geek and Sundry and we, we were making hundreds of web videos a year and I was burnt out creatively. And so I took the 
set back really, really personally. And it was years before I wrote again, which, you know, because I was, I was burning out and it was like a clinically, I was clinically depressed and anxious because of, I was just pushing myself too hard in a lot of different ways and areas that I wasn't necessarily loving, but I felt I needed to for reputation and ego and just opportunity's sake. Um, and, but the great thing is that in 2018, five years ago, I uh, was approached and I talked with Audible and I was like, here's the project I want to make. And they were like, great, go tell the story you want to tell. And I'm so grateful for it because honestly, there's no way this would have been the TV show that I was able to make. Other people would have second guessed me. They would have not liked some characters. They would have steered the story different ways because ultimately television is a product of the, the network. And when you work in books and in my experience with Audible Audio, they're really there to help guide your vision more than try to make it into their vision of your show. So I am so excited and I wrote over COVID alone. I was supposed to have a staff writer, you know, helping me and I didn't because it was COVID. So I wrote 400 pages and it was the best experience of my life because I'd never written something that long form before. And then I just called my friends. I wrote parts for my friend, Will Wheaton. I called Neil Gaiman and I was like, do you like this? Would you do it for me? And I never thought that he would say yes. Uh, down the line, just favor, 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 favor. And I'm so proud of the cast. And I'm, I'm really excited for people to listen to it because it is, you know, a baby. It's a baby of mine. <laughs> it's uh, a token of your goodwill too with all the collaborators. I remember for my three books too, it's my whole philosophy was I got to promote everyone else's book before my yeah. book comes out. And that, ends up working out really well because everyone has different needs. And so if you're like helping them when they need help, when you need it, that's just kind of how a lot of the arts happen, especially if people are good human beings, obviously. But yeah. I think one of the big challenges is, is like, if you are me, you and a lot of uh, people in, I guess, our networks, it's, there's so many things you want to do, right? It's so easy to get burned out because like, you're just really excited about this. There's so many, you know, stories, as you're saying, you want to tell in different mediums and ways of doing things. And, I think part of the challenge becomes what do you say no to? I think that becoming a parent was the best thing that ever happened to me in that I realized I'm finite, my time is finite, and this person is important and needs to be made room for. And so when you start parsing your literal minutes of your day, you realize, oh, I can't do it all anymore. And it's like the best lesson because especially if you have boundless creativity and it's, you know, you have too many ideas and you're too excited about things. Um, this other person who needs you in a fundamental way will make you be ruthless with what is important to you. And so, in fact, in having a kid, I know myself way better and I'm able to value my time better. I'm able to eliminate things that don't mean as much to me because somebody else is there and needs any minute that I don't have for myself. And so, you know, it, it, yeah, it, it really was a good lesson and it made me steer my career much more in the direction of writing and performing versus producing other things and mass media versus like curated. So I would rather make 10 episodes of something every five years now than 300 videos of which maybe 10% I'm like, these are amazing. I don't want to make the other 90% anymore. I just want to focus on the 10% of me and 10% of the product that I can make. Absolutely. And now over the course of your career, you've played with a lot of different mediums. Obviously, Audible is one of the, the newer ones. How do you decide which medium to tell stories in and what role you should play in each project? So for mediums, I just ex get excited about any new one. I'm working on a musical now and a stage cool. play. So because and I, I have a novel that I really want to write. So clearly I am not the kind of person who is like, oh, I did that. I'm going to do it again and again and again. I can't do it. It's just my <laughs> it's not who I am. I always am trying to push the boundary of what I would like to do and I you kind of have to do it to figure out am I good at this am I attracted to this? it's not even a talent thing it's like what do you want to grind on what do you want to really put your attention on and break apart and work on it obsessively I'm a gamer so I know if I have a game and I want to play it I'll play it eight hours a day um, and I want to have the work that brings that kind of gamer out in me. And so making things and making with this other is the fundamental. It's really not the venue. And as far as my role in it, you know, again, I took a, a step back to be a producer a lot. And I tried to, you know, I sold some things in television as a producer. And I created some amazing franchises with my company um, in role-playing games and tabletop games and things like that. And I'm so proud of that. But at the same time, I always felt FOMO and left out because I wanted to be 
not the center of attention, but I just want to be a performer in it. I want to participate. And so knowing that about myself, I know I'll always have some kind of performance role. I don't need to be the center of attention, the lead. I would love to be in the ensemble because again, um, I want to play <laughs> and being behind the scenes only is not, I found is not a hundred percent satisfying. Makes sense. And especially because you have so many different talents and experiences, you're trying to kind of mold some of those experiences and talents into new areas as well, it seems. Yeah, I'm willing to fail too. You know, I'm sure there's something. I mean, that's guaranteed in our space. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And that's okay. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And what's your best piece of career advice? I mean, it goes really back to the last uh, question I answered. Um, You know, figure out what you're good at that you love doing, but also no one else can do as well as you. Um, Because especially in a world where we need to be, you know, we need to do all the hats. We not not only are a writer or songwriter or singer, like whatever it is you do, um, you have to do 20 other things, not only including social media, but performance and PR and marketing and, uh, you know, everything. And in running a company where I had to do it all, I spread myself so thin that I didn't realize that I was becoming completely ineffective at what was special about me and what got me to the place that allowed me to have a company. And so, um, you know, I have a lot of areas where I'm a little blind spotty, especially in running a business and, and finances and managing people. Those are, I had no experience in all of that. And especially being homeschooled, managing people was impossible. Um, it was really tough for me. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to let go of people who were not good for the aggregate. I didn't know how to, um, yeah, it was just a lot of, a lot of things like that. So for me, I guess the best advice is hone in on what you not only are good at, but you are passionate about that you want to do. And I know it's not like find your passion. That's really corny, but, uh, find out, find what you are, doesn't feel like work to you. See if you can make a career out of it. And, and once you get into the businessification of that, don't let all the other things that draw your attention and time away steal away from what you're meant to be doing and what you're there to do well that's great advice and thank you so much for being on the show thanks a lot dan